What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat. Reserved. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. We're jumping back into the rankings broken down by tiers. Last week, we did running backs and wide receivers. We took a little break on Monday to talk about some league winners. Some late round picks. Guys going in the eighth, ninth, double digit rounds that I think could help win your 2019 fantasy football league if things break accordingly. So if you missed Monday's video, go check that out. Yesterday, Noah and myself talked about the best fantasy football playoff matches, matchups for quarterbacks. So if you missed that one, go check it out. Of course, we're going five videos a week, every week until the season starts, and then probably into the season as well. So we got a hell of a lot of content coming your way. Today, we're talking about the quarterback position. Before we get into the actual rankings, I know a lot of people kind of just throw quarterbacks, you know, into the wind because they play in one quarterback leagues and it doesn't really matter who you pick, right? Because everyone is replaceable. If someone is horrible that you end up drafting, you could just go to the waiver wire and pick someone else up. In tomorrow's video, in tomorrow's Fade the Public, we don't do any player analysis. We actually sit there for about an hour and 10 minutes. Unfortunately, I know you guys probably don't want to watch us for that long, but we talk all about league rules league settings, changes that we've made in our high stakes leagues that we are big fans of. And the number one thing I always say, I'm a huge advocate for super flex leagues. I don't like two quarterback and I explain why in that video. Super flex leagues, for those of y'all that are new to the game, super flex is where one of your flex options can have a quarterback in it. What this does is it makes the quarterbacks a lot more valuable. And I get a lot of comments like, oh, it ruins the draft and everybody picks a quarterback in the first, second, third round. Like, guys, the quarterbacks are by far and away the most valuable position in all of sports. And then they just literally mean nothing in one quarterback leagues. So it makes it more fun. You know, the first five or six rounds of regular one quarterback leagues are literally just running backs and wide receivers. Maybe one quarterback, two quarterbacks, and like three tight ends. The rest is like 50 players of running backs and wide receivers. So I think if you've never had it, most of the people that don't like Superflex are the ones that have never tried it. It's like fucking oysters, right? Anyone you ask that doesn't like oysters just probably hasn't eaten them, right? Same thing here. Try Superflex, guys. Advocate it to the rest of your league. I promise you will not go back once you go to, I was going to make a weird reference there, but once you go to Superflex, you won't go back. So these are my rankings for the 2019 fantasy football season. Top 15 quarterbacks broken down by tier. If at any point you want the top 20 of them, you can go download that link in the description. It'll be the first comment also pinned in the comment section down below, um, broken down by tiers. So you don't even actually have to listen to me. If you want all my positions, my rankings, my top 250 big board, positional rankings broken down by tiers, running backs, wide receivers, whatever, you can go cop that in the Big Dogs Draft Guide, bigdogsdraftguide.com. Wow, this launches in less than two weeks. That just made me super nervous. So yesterday would have been two weeks ago. Nope, it's Wednesday. So two days ago would have been two weeks until launch. So we have a lot of stuff cooking up in the HQ right now. Today is my top 15 quarterback rankings for the 2019 fantasy football season. Let's get it. Tier number one, we're going to call this the sling and D tier. And it should come as no surprise, my first quarterback off the board will be Patrick Mahomes of the Kansas City Chiefs. This will result entirely on what happens with Tyreek Hill and his suspension. If he gets suspended two games, uh, Patrick Mahomes might move back into a tier by himself. If Tyreek Hill misses significant time, I'm very, very, very nervous that Mahomes will struggle to come anywhere near the end of season numbers that he put up last year. But at full force, man, this Chiefs team is almost unstoppable, right? They led the NFL in points per game last year with nearly 35 points per game in yards per game. I think it was 418 yards per game. They were top five in terms of pace, in terms of snaps, like seconds between snaps. So it's it's something that's going to continue to be there, especially with Mahomes, his big playability, and his underrated rushing ability too. In his uh, final two seasons in college, he ran for 22 rushing scores. So I think even if we see a dip in passing yards, I think um, we'll probably end up seeing Mahomes finish with like five or six rushing touchdowns this year because that's something that we didn't see often. I think they're going to utilize uh, that run pass option down there that works really, really well for them because they have so many weapons. And we'll see a few of them break more towards Mahomes' way. So he's in this tier, um, but that is dependent on what Tyreek Hill's suspension is. If he is suspended for a long time, then it's a lot closer to, in my opinion, with the rest of these guys. 
and I would not be looking at Mahomes in the third or fourth round. If Hill misses like anywhere between like six and more games, Mahomes drops back to that, you know, fifth, sixth range where I'm taking only the best quarterbacks and that's very high up. If you're looking at it from a super flex standpoint, Mahomes is still a first round pick. Luck, Rodgers, Watson are all borderline end of first, early second, mid second ish round picks in my opinion right now. Um, that's how super flex works, right guys? Cause they're super valuable. The bigger your league gets, the more valuable they are, right? If you're in a 16 man league, every single team is gonna own two quarterbacks in a super flex league, which means all 32 starting quarterbacks are off the board. So you need to value them properly. The smaller your league is, the less you need to worry about drafting a quarterback. And that goes for one quarterback leagues as well, because think about it, if you're in an eight man or a 10 man league, only 10 quarterbacks are gonna be started, which means the quarterbacks on the waiver wire are gonna be a lot a lot better, right? If you're in a 14 man league, 14 players are starting, which means, you know, probably four to six other teams are carrying a backup quarterback, which means, you know, the top 20 quarterbacks are off the waiver wire. So you can let the quarterback slide, but you know, the bigger the league is, the more I think you need to be concerned with the quarterbacks because only one quarterback can start each week in real NFL. Whereas, you know, if it's a running back or wide receiver, someone gets hurt, you can always pick up the 60th ranked wide receiver in fantasy and they will put up more than a zero for you on your scoreboard. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, so we have Mahomes at one, and then the next three are like just so close. I, I, I can't really argue with any of them as a two, three, four. I have Andrew Luck as a two. I don't think he has the ceiling that we've seen from Patrick Mahomes already. Because Patrick Mahomes broke records last year. He won't hit that number again. We'll see a little bit of a statistical regression, but I don't think we need to be dramatic about it. He's still probably gonna throw up 4,500 yards and, and 40 passing touchdowns, something along those lines. If Andrew Luck, ends up with more fantasy points at the end of this year than Patrick Mahomes, I would not be shocked at all. You look at the offense, right? It's an improved weapons core. They bring in Paris Campbell, the explosive rookie who absolutely blew away the combine and was a, a stud for the Buckeyes during his last year in college. They bring in Devin Funches, who's going to be another great red zone threat. Hopefully we'll get Jack Doyle back, who has historically been one of Andrew Luck's favorite targets. Just overall having those tight ends on the field, I think is enormous for Andrew Luck because he utilizes them as much as any uh, quarterback does in football. And that's, you know, down by the end zone, down by the red zone. Um, he is so accurate and so precise hitting those tight ends there. And I think like 30% of his touchdowns over the last five years that he's been healthy have been to tight ends. And so it's at a, an enormous rate. And then you just look at the offensive line, man. Second per football outsiders, uh, ninth per PFF in terms of just overall offensive line. Another year of continuity, them being very young. I think that's that's so important, uh, super underrated. And it's a reason why I think they're going to go from, you know, top tier to like really elite. This is a crazy stat I found. In 2017, the Indianapolis Colts allowed the single most quarterback sacks. In 2018, they allowed the single fewest quarterback sacks. So they went from allowing the most sacks to allowing the fewest sacks in one year's time. That is absolutely insane. Um, you also look at like Andrew Luck came into the year less than 100%. And I mean, I, I guess you could say that's somewhat my opinion, but they had the, the telling part is, well, first of all, he didn't look great throwing the ball deep in those first few games. They had Jacoby Brissett come on the field for one of the Hail Mary throws at the end of the game, which tells you that they were a little nervous about letting Luck go like full force and unleash that, you know? So that tells me that he was at least uh, less than 100% for like the first couple of weeks. So now he's got, you know, this full off season. He is fully 100% as we saw for most of the year last year. This line, continuity of the offense, the new pieces coming in that are going to be explosive and going to be on the right parts of the field for him to, you know, take advantage of them. Um, and then you look at what Luck did last year, like Luck was the quarterback two in fantasy from week four onward, right? I mentioned how he didn't come in at full strength, but from week four onward, he was the quarterback two in fantasy behind Mahomes. He averages three and a half points per game fewer than Mahomes did over the final 13 games, 34 passing touchdowns over that span. So two and a half, almost three passing touchdowns a game for Luck. He had that ridiculous streak of eight straight games with three or more passing touchdowns. And I really feel like if Luck is healthy for the full 16, we're getting like a 4,800 yard, 30 eight touchdown season out of him. Um, he's low key athletic, so he'll give you some rushing touchdowns as well. He had nine games last year of more than 23 fantasy points. And if you're in a six point per passing touchdown league, he went absolutely nuts for you, right? Those eight straight games with three or more passing touchdowns. So luck is just like, I can't imagine someone with a higher floor, but that also gives you a fantastic ceiling. He set a career high in completion percentage, attempts and completions. If there is a concern, it's that they'll be a little bit more run heavy in 2019. They improve their defense. I think they'll look to control the ball more, right? And that's why I absolutely love Marlon Mack. It means that you probably don't have to attempt so many downfield throws, 
But again, this is going to be one of the best offenses in the NFL with an elite quarterback, good weapons, and an elite offensive line. So not much to look past here in terms of luck. If, if, if you're trying to fade luck, you're just getting cute. Aaron Rodgers, he's an interesting case because I feel like him being 35, 36 years old is kind of just a non-factor because we've gotten used to the point where quarterbacks get old and it doesn't really affect them until like we really see a big drop off. And we definitely didn't see that from Aaron Rodgers last year. He'll be 36 in December, right? So the thing that actually low-key makes me a little bit nervous about Rodgers is like none of the injuries he's had have been like truly dramatic and, and like career changing to the point. But the thing with getting older is that the injuries affect you far more, right? It's hard to recover fully from them. Um, and, and I think they give you a higher risk of re-injuring whatever it is that you've been hurting so much over, over the few years. So being 35, 36 is not as easy to recover from a uh, serious injury. So if, for instance, like if, if Brees or Brady went down with a serious injury this year, it, that's probably it for them. You know, um, if they stay healthy, this is why they're continuing to play at such a high level. But it makes me a little bit nervous for Aaron Rodgers because he's continually piling up these injuries. He missed nine games in 2017 with that broken collarbone. Last year, obviously, he was banged up. Although I don't want to use the excuse last year of him being banged up for anything that happened because, like, he finished with 4,442 passing yards, 25 to 2 touchdown to interception ratio. He threw two interceptions on, like, 597 pass attempts. That is an absurd... That's... What is that, 3%? Is that less than 3 Is that 0.3% of his pass attempts, I think? And the other thing is, he had 269 yards on the ground. So 270 rushing yards and two scores. Uh, and I feel like a lot of people will be like, oh, his knee was bad. And like, normally he'll rush for more, normally he'll rush for more yards. But like that 269 yards was, he only had a handful of seasons in his career that he's actually had more rushing yards. So if, if one of your points of analysis is, oh, well, his knee was hurt or whatever was hurt. And that's, you know, he could have had more rushing yards. It's like he had just as many rushing yards as he normally does. So I'm not looking at that as something that we could pin for like positive um, progression. It just felt like a bad year out of Rodgers because... He, he basically has had any year where he's played a full, you know, 15, 16 games, he's finished as a top two fantasy quarterback. Last year, he was quarterback seven overall, quarterback 10 in fantasy points per game. He suffered the MCL sprain in week one, along with a, what they're calling a tibial plateau fracture, which limited him a bit. But again, I'm not going to use that as an excuse because his stats were still there at the end of the year. And one of the things I talk about all the time is quarterback touchdown rates in terms of the percentage of their throws that go for touchdowns, right? And that's an easy way to see whether or not you think or an easy way to see where their touchdown totals are going to be the following year. Like Matt Ryan was always like a career 4.8, 5.2 touchdown percentage guy. That MVP season he had in 2016, it jumped up to like 6.7 after like six years of having a sample size of it being around 5%, right? So we knew that he was going to go back down to his career average and have a little bit of a drop off year uh, the year after his MVP season. And then he had a really bad year that season, which was way below his norm. So we knew the following year, last year, he was going to bounce back up. And that's why he was one of my... Um, top like bounce back players like post type sleepers last year and this is just a, a pretty predictive stat from what we've seen in the fantasy industry and Aaron Rodgers last year in his career as a starter in Green Bay prior to 2018 so 2008 through 2017 his career touchdown rate has been about 6.5 percent which is really 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 high among quarterbacks and that's what tends to happen when you're really 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 good last year 4.2 percent which was by far and away the almost by two percent the lowest of his time as a starter in Green Bay. The closest rate he's had during the season to that 4.2% was his first year in 2008 as the quarterback for Green Bay, which was 5.2%, a whole percentage point higher. Which So this screams absolute positive bounce back in terms of the touchdowns that he's going to throw, right? He attempted 597 pass attempts last year. A touchdown rate of 4.2% gave him the 25 touchdowns that he threw for. Had he even matched his career low prior to that, He's looking at over 31 passing touchdowns. If he bounces back to his career average of like 6.3, 6.5%, you're looking at 39 passing touchdowns. So he's way more likely to be around the 40 passing touchdown mark than he is the 25 passing touchdown mark. But Matt LaFleur coming in as the new head coach. It's going to be a new offense, um, and I get that everyone is excited about it, but when you look at the numbers, I'm not drafting Rodgers because of LaFleur. I'm drafting him because I think he's going to see a huge bounce back in touchdowns. Like for as much as everyone hated Mike McCarthy, Green Bay was eighth fastest in terms of pace. Um, they weren't really stalled at all in terms of like running a slow offense. They were top 12 in fewest three and outs per drive. Uh, meanwhile, you look at Matt LaFleur's offense, Tennessee last year had the fifth slowest pace in all of the NFL per footballoutsiders.com. So the one concern I have is that this offense won't actually be improved by LaFleur. Uh, there's going to be a lot of hype around it because LaFleur came from the um, McVay coaching tree. But when you look at the numbers, 
they don't really spit the, those facts. The, the, these are the big facts, people. And that's what we try to give you here all the time. Those are the big facts. I, I wish they had added another weapon for Aaron Rodgers, like John Brown or someone in free agency. Um, they added the third round rookie, Jay Sternberger, the tight end at a and I like him, but I mean, he's a, he's a rookie tight end. So I don't expect much from him. So I have Rodgers there as a quarterback three. So we have Mahomes, we have Luck, we have Rodgers, we have Deshaun Watson. If you guys are enjoying the video, one, hit that thumbs up button. Uh, it lets me know you appreciate the, the work that I put in um, to put out all these big facts for y'all. Hit the subscribe button if you are new to the channel. Share this with your friends. I'll drop a comment down below if you agree with this tier. And do you think Baker Mayfield should be in this top tier? Because I think a lot of you will probably disagree with where I have him ranked. I think he's, I've seen him go in the top tier for a lot of, uh, for a lot of expert rankings. Let's get into Deshaun Watson. He rounds out the tier. Uh, he went nuts in his rookie year on a small sample size. The easiest tell that he was going to regress was his ridiculous touchdown rate. As we explained to Aaron Rodgers, his rate was at like eight, nine percent. So you knew that was going to come down. It did. Um, but he backed it up in 2018 by coming, becoming a much more efficient and much better passer as a quarterback, right? He played in all 16 games. He was a little bit banged up, but he absolutely cemented himself as an elite fantasy option in Houston. Again, behind a miserable offensive line, they ranked dead last in pass blocking per football outsiders. They were bottom 12 per pro football focus. They allowed the single most sacks with 62 in the NFL last year. They used their first round pick on Titus Howard, this uh, versatile offensive lineman out of Alabama State after they got absolutely sniped by the Eagles on Dillard, um, a pick before them. And then they had two second round picks, uh, one of which they used on another offensive lineman. So after five years, of miserable offensive line play, they finally realized that maybe we should invest in it. Now we have a quarterback that would probably, you know, do well if we had a nice offensive line in front of him. Um, so that seemed to be their plan this offseason. You, you look at the weapons group they have too. I really, really, really like it. I mean, health is a big concern with a lot of their wideouts. You have Hopkins as clearly one of the best wideouts in the NFL. Will Fuller, Kiki QT, and uh, Kahali Waring. I really, really like this rookie tight end. Third round rookie tight end. Um, it's between all four of those players, I think this is a fantastic supporting cast for, for Watson if they stay on the field. I absolutely love Kiki QT to have a, a little breakout this year. Last year, you know, when you look at Watson, how he improved, he raised his completion percentage from 61.8% up to 68.3%. So almost 6% in um, completion percentage. But more importantly, his adjusted completion percentage, which accounts for things like throwaways, like spike balls and, and shit like that. His adjusted completion percentage last year was 65.6%. This year, it jumped up to 76.1%. That's a full 10.5% increase in adjusted completion percentage for Watson. He got way less reckless, far more accurate. Uh, last year, he was throwing the deep ball, or two years ago, sorry, his rookie year, he was throwing the deep ball on nearly 20% of his throws per PFF, which is a ridiculously high number. Last year, that number was down to 11.1%. So like I said, he got less reckless, and those numbers are around where like Drew Brees or Andrew Luck, you know, picks and chooses their deep spots. And what I love about Watson, you know, he has that upside that a lot of quarterbacks in this tier even don't have. He'll throw for 250 yards and two touchdowns on any given week, but he'll also give you like 40 yards and a score on the ground, right? And he's he could definitely break out for like 80 yards and two touchdowns on the ground um, once or twice a year. So that boosts you from solid quarterback numbers of like 20 to 24 fantasy points per game up to like that 30, 35, 40 weak winning mark. Um, and it's extremely tough for a non-rushing quarterback to hit a ceiling like that. So my only concern for him is kind of like his health, right? We've seen him miss significant injury time his rookie year. And then he was banged up a little bit last year as well. As you know, as someone that runs around a lot, you are going to take hits. And uh, that is always a risk with him. They do upgrade the offensive line a little bit. So you kind of have to put that into the equation when you're talking about injury risk. So that's a little bit of a positive, but I'll put him at four just because it's a little bit difficult to project him for 16 games confidently. I won't, I won't say it's hard to project him for that because he just did it, but confidently it's hard to project him for that. We have Matt Ryan as quarterback five, Carson Wentz, Baker Mayfield, Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray, Cam Newton. Matt Ryan, 4,923 passing yards, 35 passing touchdowns, which were realistically very, very close to his 2016 MVP season. Week one last year, Patrick Mahomes goes absolutely off. Matt Ryan has the worst performance of his season. Um, it was that road game against Philadelphia Thursday Night Football that actually kicked off the NFL season. I remember that. It was horrible. But from weeks two through the rest of the year, Mahomes only scored three fantasy points more per game than Matt Ryan did. And Mahomes had the single greatest fantasy football season of all time. So that should say something about Matt Ryan following week one. Uh, a few things that you should have on the radar when it comes to Matt Ryan. 
He scored the most garbage points of any quarterback in fantasy football last year. This is a fact. This is from an article that I cannot find. I wish I could read it, or I wish I could source it for you. But just trust me, it's a big fact. He scored the most garbage time fantasy points of any quarterback last year. Makes sense given that the um, the defense was absolutely decimated within the first couple weeks, and they had games where they were just letting up 40 points like consecutively week after week after week. So that's not something I expect to happen this year, which might turn down the passing game a little bit. But they did draft two offensive linemen in the first round who both excel in the pass blocking portion of the game, which is obviously an upgrade. Dirk Cutter comes back as the offensive coordinator after head coaching in Tampa for the last few years. He was the offensive coordinator from 2012 to 2014 in Atlanta. During those years, Matt Ryan averaged 4,643 passing yards and almost 29 passing touchdowns a season. He was a top 12 quarterback in all three years and was in the top half of those rankings for two of the three years. During those seasons, Atlanta passed the ball on over 65% of their plays. They were top seven in terms of percentage of passing rate, like their passing rate in all three seasons. So top seven in the NFL under Cutter, all three seasons, uh, including 2013 when they were the single pass heaviest offense in the NFL, throwing it on nearly 69% of their plays per teamrankings.com. The other crazy thing about Matt Ryan is that he's literally in, in a dome through week 11 this season. He doesn't play any games outside um, until week 12, or it might even be week 13 because I'm not sure when their bye week is, but it, it's a crazy, 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 crazy thing. So 13 of their 16 games this season are in a dome. And while he was, I, I don't want you to push that narrative too much because me and Noah actually talked about it on uh, Tuesday's video, I believe. He was great in the dome last year. 2018, his numbers were, the splits were fantastic. But if you go back to 2017, if you go back to 2016, his numbers inside of a dome and outside of a dome were nearly identical. So I'm not going to ride that home just because we're going off of recency bias of last year. When you look at the numbers, they weren't really that far off. And I'll put them on the screen for you guys to, to kind of take a look at. I, I think we're just in store for another great season for Matt Ryan, a high floor guy that has a pretty high ceiling as well. And we move on to Carson Wentz. And I went really deep into Carson Wentz on my bounce back, my top post high sleepers bounce back players video, which I'll link up here as well as in the description down below. So I don't want to go like too crazy on him right now. I just, I mean, you look at the offensive line is going to be very good as per usual. The weapons group is ridiculous there between getting to Sean Jackson. I think it's going to be a monster upgrade for them. Alshon Jeffrey, um, JJ Arcega Whiteside is going to be a great red zone weapon. Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard in his second year. Miles Sanders is finally a really good pass catching back out of the backfield. So I think he's absolutely set up to just dominate in 2019. He shed the knee brace. He's going to be running a little bit more. He's full go at OTAs. There is no injury setback or anything like that. I was a little bit concerned if we, you know, if they had him like monitoring his practice reps or something like that, but apparently he is full go. So I'm full go on Carson Wentz as my quarterback six with probably top three upside. After Carson Wentz, we have Baker Mayfield. So when Freddie Kitchens took over in Cleveland last year, Baker Mayfield was absolutely incredible. This is a stat that I tweeted out. You see it's on December 13th, which was around week 15 or week 16. So this is not the full rest of season after Kitchens took over, but this is a good portion of when Kitchens took over with Baker Mayfield at quarterback, continuing on forward. Since the Browns got rid of their coaches in week nine, they lead the NFL in yards per play. They've allowed a league low three sacks. Baker Mayfield leads the NFL in yards per attempt have converted 14 of 14 red zone opportunities into touchdowns. That is 1 million percent. I mean, that was per a Roto World podcast of uh, Raymond Summerland. And I think, I forget who else was on that podcast, but just, just trust me. So he was incredible throughout, right? Baker was a ridiculously good rookie. He was someone I loved coming into the rookie year. He was so accurate coming out of college. I mean, there was really no knocks on him other than his size. Um, there were people pegging him like Johnny Manziel, which is a horrible comparison. He set the record for most touchdown passes as a rookie with 27, right? And he barely, he only played two and a half, uh, he, he missed two and a half games, basically. As I mentioned in one of last week's videos, hype around Baker is very, 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 very high. But when you look at what like Vegas has him statted out as, they put the over under at 4,200 passing yards and 30 passing touchdowns. Those are excellent sophomore season numbers for a quarterback, right? 30 passing touchdowns, 4,200 yards. But they're not game-changing in fantasy. They're not to the point where... And Vegas is not, you know, by, by no means is Vegas black and white. Like, okay, they said that's the over-under, so that's exactly what's going to happen. But I think they give you a realistic point of view. Like, they're not going to set Baker at 4,800 passing yards for the over-under because that's, that's ridiculous. But those numbers, if he goes for, you know, 42, 4,300 passing yards and flirts with 30 touchdowns are great. They're not game-changing in fantasy whatsoever. They're not putting you to the point where you want to jump up and, and grab them in, you know, the first round of Superflex or you know, around the Patrick Mahomes, Andrew Lux in one quarterback leagues. Those numbers are what you're going to get from Matt Ryan and likely other like four quarterbacks that you're going to be able to get later. And those are the numbers that like Kirk Cousins pretty much put up last year. 
Um, I, I think one of the under radar under the radar concerns for Baker this year is his is his volume. Uh, I think this team is going to run the ball a lot. I think Nick Chubb is going to carry the ball like 20 to 25 times a game. I love them bringing in Todd Munkin as the offensive coordinator, um, but apparently and unfortunately he won't be calling the plays. And apparently there's also like some kind of rift behind the scenes um, with Todd Munkin has not been great at assimilating to this offense. I'm assuming it has to do with Freddie Kitchens like taking control of the offense. And I'm not going to read too much into that because I just think the talent is like ridiculous in, in Cleveland and they're going to have a great offense regardless. But it's something to monitor there. Um, they have a lot of personality on that offense and a lot of things could come up in the locker room, could cause problems. We'll have to see. When Kitchens took over though, in the eight games following, Baker had some big passing volume games for sure, right? He went over 40 passing attempts three times, but he still only averaged 32.9 passing attempts per game, which I don't think is an unreasonable projection this year. Uh, maybe he'll have a few more pass attempts per game than that, but are the 40 plus touchdown seasons coming for Baker? I absolutely think they are, but I think it's probably going to be in like 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, I think we need to temper expectations a little bit for Baker this year. Someone I am not tempering expectations for is Kyler Murray. And I've seen him ranked as highly as quarterback five in some some industry folks' rankings. And I get it because they want to be like, yeah, at the end of the season, if he does well, they want to be like, yeah, I liked him the most. And I, you know, I was up there putting him in the top five, top four. Uh, I think it's just a little bit too cute in my opinion. Do I think he has top five in his range of outcomes? Yes. But I also think that projecting players or ranking them where their ceiling is, is, is not a good process. I'll only do that with Marlon Mack. Murray comes into a situation which is really one of like the wildest, most intriguing storylines that we've seen in the NFL in, in quite some time, right? He's new. He's flashy. We have new head coach, Cliff Kingsbury, who's also flashy. Um, he takes over to install this air raid offense that he ran throughout college successfully from the offensive side of things. They draft three wide receivers, Andy Isabella, King Butler, and um, Keyshawn Johnson, I think it was, in the sixth round or so. While only marginally improving their offensive line from last year, which was absolutely atrocious, the weapons group is going to be good. I think they're going to be a lot better in a couple of years. They still have a lot of improvement to go. They have Christian Kirk coming into his second year, who's going to be, I think, fantastic. Larry Fitz is still going to be there as a good blanket. And then they have these rookies who aren't going to put up great stats, but they'll be good pieces for the offense. Uh, they're all hyped, but also unproven, right? I imagine Kyler's going to be scrambling for his life a lot of the time because the offensive line. I and mean, that could be a good thing for fantasy. I mean, it's not unprecedented when you look back at Cam Newton, who did his rookie year, right? He was a top three fantasy quarterback. But he also did that on the heels of 14 rushing touchdowns. Now, you would never project a player to finish the season with 14 rushing touchdowns outside of maybe uh, Marlon Mack. I love him as a passer, but our arm talent will only get you so far when you're running from your running for your life the entire time. The offensive line is, is not only a concern because he'll have pressure in his face the whole time, but he's going to take a lot of hits. And at his size, and his size is not necessarily something I'm concerned about because if you, know, if you look at this tweet, he weighed in three pounds heavier than Russell Wilson did and just three quarters of an inch shorter than Russell Wilson did at their combine. Though, if you look at other pictures of Kyler Murray standing around people who are like 5'11", 5'10", he's not, he's not 5'10". I don't know how he pulled off that number at the combine, but he's, he's clearly like 5'8". Does that matter, right? Or is that, just, is that just a view that people are throwing on him for no reason? Kyler had just 1.3% of his passes batted down at the line of scrimmage last year in college. When you compare that to Drew Luck, who's 6'4", 1.8%, and Daniel Jones, who's 6'5", 3.8%. 1%. And he's, he was playing at Oklahoma. They got some big linemen there, nfl size linemen. My, my concern is more so just the, the, his stature overall, his size, and, and taking a lot of hits behind the poor offensive line. My, the size in terms of like seeing over the linemen is not a concern for me at all because he did fine with that in college. The Cardinals led up the fourth most quarterback hits last year and the fifth most sacks in 2018. So the hits are coming. Hopefully, Kyler being thick can keep him upright and keep him on the field. He didn't really take hits in college. Like I said, they got a beast line there in Oklahoma. Um, so we'll have to see how that stands up. And right behind him, as I brought up prior, was Cam Newton, right? Cam Newton's had plenty of top five fantasy uh, finishes. He wraps up this tier for me. I'm not going to waste your time telling you, oh my God, Cam Newton, such a good value. You know, if uh, quarterback 10 is an amazing upside plus value or whatever, like we all know that. If his shoulder is good to go, he's likely going to finish the year as a top five or six fantasy quarterback. But you can't just discount the shoulder. He's had two serious shoulder injuries over the last couple of years. This time he's had much longer to recover. If he had, if he had the shoulder surgery like three months after what he did this year, he'd be on my do not draft list for sure. Even even with all the reports saying, oh, he's going to be fine for training camp. He'll be fine for week one. That's an easy fade because they've already gone through this process and his shoulder was fucked up. 
but he had a lot more time to recover. And he's already throwing full-size footballs, which was not the case last time around. As long as he doesn't start sitting out practices and they and you know he's full go for everything, I'm ready to roll with Cam Newton as a top 10 quarterback. I imagine there's going to be a lot of reports saying that his accuracy is going to be off and he's going to be very rusty, which is probably going to happen after a shoulder surgery. But he's going to take some time to have to you know, regain that full strength in, in the muscles around the shoulder. But if he can do that, man, I'm right back on the Cam Bam train. Both of those guys, I think, are the perfect one quarterback league draft pick because they both have, I'm talking about Kyler and Cam, they both have top five upside because of their rushing ability. But if they don't work out or if they get hurt, there are always going to be guys on the waiver wire. All right, y'all, let's get to tier number three. And I also want to just say uh, I am giving away three of my draft guides. Uh, Within the draft guide, like I said, we have the top 250 big board, all the positional rankings by tiers. You got my top sleepers, my top busts, my must draft players. You have the market share worksheet, which I'm working on, which is amazing. It's basically the market share of every player in the NFL and like every stat you could think of, receiving yards, targets, carries, goal line carries, red zone targets, like everything is in there. It's going to be amazing. Also working on consistency charts and something I've not announced yet. I know a lot of you guys are a big fan of Dr. Jesse Morse. Dr. Jesse Morse will be doing an exclusive piece for the draft guide, breaking down basically any injury related player from last year, which is like 40 players. And he will be doing write-ups on every single one of them from an injury perspective. So that's not something I I, uh, thought was going to happen. But we got together over the last couple of days. We spoke about it. Good business opportunity. And I know it was going to give you guys a lot more value. value. I know you guys love when Dr. Morse comes onto the channel. So that will also be included in the draft guide. Along with my big dog's got to eat Bible, which is like 8,000 words. Exactly how to attack your entire fantasy football draft position by position. Um, Super, super valuable. I just actually finished my top... 20 resources. So that's like the websites and resources that I personally use for all these statistics and research. I don't want to just tell you who to pick or who I think is going to be good. I want to teach y'all how to become a better fantasy football player. That's exactly what my draft guide is all about. It's going to be updated throughout the entire summer, daily, weekly, whatever. It's got all my rankings also going to be updated. New things are going to be added in as the summer goes on. You can grab it on your phone, your tablet, your laptop. I was going to say your calculator. You know what? Fuck it, man. We might really be all, we might go all out 2019 and let you have it on your calculator too. So bring your TI-83 pluses, baby. We go and bike to high school. Let's move over to tier number three. Oh, also you can cop that at bigdogsdraftguide.com. I probably should have said that. Tier number three. We're going to call this, it is what it'd be. James Winston, Dak Prescott, Jared Goff, Drew Brees, Lamar Jackson. Uh, Move Dak Prescott above James Winston there, but we'll talk about James Winston first. No one was higher on James Winston entering this offseason than I was. Um, The first time I did this video, the quarterback rankings video, I believe he was literally my quarterback five ahead of where Matt Ryan is, I think. But that was all the way back in February. However, I think losing the pieces of Deshaun Jackson and and Adam Humphreys are going to be low-key a much bigger impact than a lot of people are making it out to be. I mention continuity on my videos all the time. Continuity is so important, whether it's with your weapons group, with your offensive line, like these things really matter. The way I look at it, the more var- variables you put in play, the more unknowns you add to the equation, the riskier the player becomes. Um, and that's it's not a positive, right? The big storyline this offseason, of course, was adding Bruce Arians as the head coach in Tampa Bay. And everything will kind of depend on whether or not Bruce Arians will make this offense and make James Winston more efficient as a quarterback. We know the volume is there. We know the passing yards are there. We know he's a slinger and he'll take deep shots and the weapons are good. But is this going to be a team that, is Jameis going to match his touchdown and interception ratio to be the same? Like, that's a big problem as a fantasy quarterback. The problem, though, is with when looking at Bruce Arians and putting that on a pedestal is like they had Dirk Cutter and Todd Munkin last year, and they were the sixth highest passing rate team in the NFL. And the year before that, they were the third highest rate of passing plays to running plays in the entire NFL. Of all his time as an OC or a head coach, Arians has had one big year from a fantasy quarterback. It was Carson Palmer in Arizona in 2015, threw for 4,671 yards, 35 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. That averaged out to 20 fantasy points per game, which would have had Winston as quarterback nine last year. So the problem is like Dirk Cutter and Todd Munkin were some of the most pass heavy coaches in the entire NFL. So the volume is not going anywhere. If anything, I would actually assume that it's going to go down in 2019. I think they're going to throw the ball less with Bruce Arians. Um, Winston is a turnover machine, right? And I'd be shocked if he produced anywhere near those Carson Palmer 35 to 11 touchdown interception ratio. And that, again, I repeat, was quarterback nine last year in fantasy. The other thing is just how many turnovers he's dealt with overall, right? He's been bottom five in interceptions per game in all four NFL seasons that he's been in the league. 
but he's also fumbled. He also fumbled the ball seven times last year in just 11 games, thanks to that offensive line, which allowed the fourth most quarterback hits in the NFL last year with 109. They didn't address the offensive line at all this offseason. They went heavy on defense, right? And people love to use that term that defense gives up points and that's good for the offense. It's not. That means that you're allowing the other offense to be on the field for a very long period of time. You have less chances. And since you have less chances, you need to be more efficient with those chances. And we know James Winston is the literal opposite of uh, efficient. So whereas I loved Winston just a few months ago, he's definitely not my favorite late round guy anymore. I'll take a stab at him in one or two of my leagues, but he's not someone that I'm projecting to finish as you know a top five quarterback that the the Buccaneers have not finished as a top 10 scoring offense since the year 2000 that's in 18 seasons guys Dak Prescott is my next quarterback who I'm going to put ahead of Jameis after me just shitting on him basically he's been a top 12 fantasy quarterback in every NFL season that he's been in the league so far quarterback six is rookie year quarterback eight sophomore year and then after a very bad start last year he finished ridiculously strong after Amari Cooper showed up and he finished as a, a, a top 12 quarterback again if you look at the splits, man, with Amari Cooper versus without him, he was ridiculous. From week six onwards, Dak Prescott was the number four quarterback in fantasy football, ahead of Andrew Luck, ahead of Deshaun Watson, ahead of Russell Wilson. This is real big facts. He is currently the 16th quarterback off the board, an absolute no-brainer. I talked about him in Monday's video as a late round possible league winner. He scored six rushing touchdowns in all three of his NFL seasons. People get bored of Dak and they don't want him because of their, you know, their run first offense. He's not exciting, but Dallas actually threw the ball in 57% of their plays last year, which was still like bottom 10 in the league, but it was around like the 22nd overall, you know, team ranking mark. That's almost a 5% increase from where it was the year prior. So you're seeing them go a lot more pass heavy. They have Kellen Moore, the OC coming in. I mean, as a new OC, he was a former quarterback. I think they're going to look to pass the ball more and use Dak and use the new weapons that they have in this offense. And, you know, you look at Dak as like a boring player, but he showed a ceiling last year, yo. Shit was real. Shit was real out here. You had a 31 and a half point game, a 29 and a half point game, a 27 and a half point game, and a 26 and a half point game. Those are like real fantastic weeks for a fantasy quarterback. So I absolutely love Dak where he's going off the board right now. Jared Goff is someone that it's hard to dislike, but I look at quarterback ranks from a super flex standpoint. And the guys that I tend to fade a little bit in super flex are the ones who have really big splits, whether it's home and away or whether it's versus top teams and bottom teams, right? And I think those guys are much easier to pick in one quarterback leagues because you could always pick someone up off the waiver wire that week, say Jared Goff is playing at Chicago. You could pick someone off off the waiver wire that's playing at home against Oakland or Miami or something like that because you'll know when to start him, right? When we got this pretty boy, right? We got the, the golden hair. He's not playing in Los Angeles for that week. He's not good right? All in all, he had a very strong regular season last year, padded by that unbelievable 54 to 51 game against the Chiefs, which I will never forget as long as I'm living, which will probably be like till October, cross his fingers. But when you look at Goff though, like he was pretty inconsistent. He went under 17 and a half fantasy points in nine of 16 games last year. That's a problem. He had some horrible games at Seattle, at Denver, at Detroit, at Chicago, like, if it ain't surfs up warm weather, bro, like, get him out of your lineup. If you look at all those games, those are on the road. Those are in tough environments, not only from a fan perspective, but like a weather perspective. On the real, though, I mean, he's a fine one quarterback starter. He's not as consistent as people probably think, but he's in a great offense, great scheme, very strong group of weapons around him. We're likely to see less girly in terms of on the ground, at least, which probably means more passing. So I don't hate Jared Goff. Then you have Drew Brees. Drew Brees, for the same reason that I talked about Michael Thomas not being in my top five fantasy wide receivers this year. Um, you can check that out in last week's wide receiver rankings video. It's kind of the same for Brees as a fantasy quarterback. He really wasn't that good as a fantasy quarterback last year, guys. When I talk about guys who have big splits, here it is. These are his home and away splits last year. Ridiculous. Over 100 passing yards more per game at home. Almost three yards per attempt more. Three passing touchdowns to 1.38 passing touchdowns. It's just night and day. And people forgot about it because in 2017, he had a good year in which the home and away splits weren't as obvious. So we forget about it. We're like, oh, Breeze has home and away splits? Yes, absolutely. And these were evident of them. The other thing here is where his splits against good defenses and bad defenses. Drew Brees pretty much had, I think it was five or six good games last year. And they were all very easily put into context about why he had those good games. 
Week one, it was that ridiculous shootout against Tampa Bay, who had one of the worst passing defenses in the NFL last year, right? When Fitzpatrick threw for like 9,000 yards, Breeze scored his 29.6 fantasy points. And like I said, we come to find out Tampa Bay has an absolutely miserable pass defense. Week three was the next of those big games. Breeze put up 40 points. That was against Atlanta. Again, the beginning of the year when Atlanta had every one of their good defensive players get hurt, and they were letting up basically 40 points a game to everyone. This next big game, 31.4 points against the Rams secondary, who struggled mightily when Aqib Tlaib was out. Then his next big game was at Cincinnati, who by that point in the season had fallen off really, really hard. They let up the third most fantasy points to quarterbacks on the year already. They were a miserable pass defense too. And then you have Philadelphia, who they played around, I think like week nine to 11 in that range, which was his last. Okay, so he had five big games and the last of which was his Philadelphia game, which if you remember by like halfway through the season, they didn't have a secondary. Every cornerback on their team was hurt. So it's like, yes, at the end of the season, he was like quarterback eight, but it was these five games in which all of them came against either horrible passing defenses or ones that were completely banged up. And that's obviously not predictive. So when you put it into context, Breeze did not play well against good defenses and he played poorly at home or poorly away versus at home. So those are two heavy of splits for me. I think this is going to be much more of a run oriented team. Like I'm, I'm, Breeze is not a guy I'm looking to draft this year. Last guy up on this list, we have Lamar Jackson. And Lamar Jackson is, is a fun one, right? So the beginning of the offseason, everyone hated Lamar Jackson. Going off of last year, how bad he looked on the field throwing the ball, right? Obviously, he put up a lot of fantasy numbers because of his legs, which are going to be a, a big factor going into this year. But he did not look good through the air. I think he will obviously improve as a passer, um, at least marginally, right? He has to. Plus, they add all the speed around him between Hollywood Brown, Miles Boykin, Justice Hill, I think Mark Andrews is going to be a super underrated player this year. I think they low-key have like a pretty decent weapons group around Lamar Jackson, albeit they are going to be young. They needed to add the speed around him. So it's not like all the defense is just completely focused on Lamar Jackson. I don't really think we need to touch on Lamar Jackson's rushing ability, right? The thing I really like about Lamar Jackson is just how heavily this team is is bought into him, right? They drafted him in the first round. Everything about the Ravens offense is completely and 100% centered around Lamar Jackson since the day they drafted him. And that's awesome to see just from a fan's perspective too, because you have so many teams and coaches that are so like half-ass, right? They do everything based on short-term. Like you could draft a guy that you think might develop well in like three years, but by that point, you're making all these short-term decisions because you need to save your job. Opposite of what Lamar Jackson did, man. They're completely buying into him. And I, I really like that. Like they could have easily, just as just as easily gone out and, and grabbed like a Ryan Fitzpatrick to compete with Lamar Jackson this year, but they didn't. And they, they shipped out Joe Flacco, um, and it's his team. And at the end of the day, right, if I'm in a one quarterback league, I'm way more intrigued with a guy like Lamar Jackson, because like I said, I like the upside guys in one quarterback leagues, because it's so easy to replace the position. And if he doesn't improve as a passer, right, and he can't get it done, or if he takes too many hits and gets hurt on the waiver wire, right? Uh, assuming you play in a 12 team league, and half of the teams take a second quarterback, you know, Trubisky, Kirk Cousins, Jimmy G, Tom Brady, Sam Darnold, all available at quarterback 19 or later, aka on your waiver wire, if it doesn't work out. Uh, I think a super flex is where it gets really interesting for Lamar Jackson because there is definitely a lot of risk involved with a guy like Lamar. Um, he could absolutely just not work out and you can't risk quarterback picks because they are like anywhere from rounds three to seven is where you're normally getting your second quarterback. Um, so the risk, you know, the opportunity cost is a lot higher there. So I love in one quarterback leagues. I'm a little bit less high on Lamar Jackson in super flex and two quarterback leagues. His upside is very real. Um, he could put up like a monster 2019 and then fall off in 2020. Like there are a lot of ways that his range of outcomes I think could work, but it's going to be super interesting. I'm super intrigued on what we get out of Lamar Jackson this year. So that will uh, wrap it up. I, I love to hear your guys' comments and thoughts on, you know, the tiers that I have broken down and what guys you think should be in other tiers that I maybe had moved around or what guys that weren't in the top 15 that you think should be. I'm sure there'll be like a lot of Mitch Trubisky's um, and guys I named Kirk Cousins, Jimmy G, things like that. So let me know your thoughts down below. While you're down there, make sure you hit that thumbs up. Make sure you um, subscribe to the channel if you're new. I realized that when I plugged in the draft guide, I didn't tell you how to enter the giveaway. I'm giving away three free draft guides for anyone that rates and reviews the podcast. So hit up iTunes, give it a five-star rating and review, or give it any star rating and review. I don't really care. Just write something. You got to screenshot it and send it to me. You could send it to me via any of the emails listed down below. DM me on Twitter, DM me on Instagram. I don't care, but that's how you enter and uh, that's it for today. So I'll see you on tomorrow's Fade the Public, where we're talking about everything 2019 fantasy football leagues, commissioners, rules, and settings. Goodbye. Goodbye.